The following is a home program on the Bhagavad Gita as it is. Chapter number 5, text number 22. Given by His Grace, Sriman Sankarshan Das Hathikari. Recorded on November 11th, 2007, in Sofia, Bulgaria. So, thank you very much to Sarvabhama Prabhu and his wife, Rustina, for inviting us all today for this nice program, their home. Today we will read from the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 5, text number 22. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Yehi Sangsparsha Jaboga Dukkha yonaya evate Adhyanta vanta konteya Nateshu ramate buddha Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada One whose happiness is within who is active and rejoices within, and whose aim is inward, is actually the perfect mystic. He is liberated in the Supreme, and ultimately he attains the Supreme. Unless one is able to relish happiness from within, how can one retire from the external engagements meant for deriving superficial happiness? A liberated person enjoys happiness by factual experience. He can therefore sit silently at any place and enjoy the activities of life from within. Such a liberated person no longer desires external material happiness. This state is called Brahma Bhutta, attaining which one is assured of going back to Godhead, back to home. Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Jata Parakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shri Shri Rupam Sagrajatam so Hagana Raguna Tan Vitam Tam Sajivam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Shya So this verse is describing the great transcendentalist Mm-hmm. What is that transcendental quality which distinguishes him from the mundaner? <clears throat> he is always able to relish happiness within. Things may be going nicely in the material world. Or things may be going disastrously in this material world. The transcendentalist is equipoised. 
This does not mean that he is callous. That he doesn't care what's going on in the material world. The transcendentalist is full of compassion, actually. He wants that everyone should become happy in Krishna consciousness. So it's not that he's artificially happy walking around with a big grin and a stupid grin on his face. He is sober. He is very sober. In that sobriety of pure service to his spiritual master and to the previous acharyas. He derives great happiness and satisfaction. His heart is pierced with feelings of sorrow for those who are not Krishna conscious. And the more he feels that compassionate uh, the word is commiseration, that means to, you know, commiserate. The more he feels commiserate, the more he is miserable seeing the misery of others. Paradukaduki. He becomes more and more happy actually within his heart. That may sound contradictory. But the more he feels sorrow in his heart, the more he becomes happy. But actually it is not contradiction. One may ask how? Here is the answer. Lord Chaitanya is feeling unlimited anguish to see the suffering of the conditioned soul. He is greatly, greatly, greatly pained to see the suffering of the conditioned living beings. So that devotee or those devotees who take that feeling of compassion on the upon they who embrace that mood of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. They are relieving Lord Chaitanya from some of his burden of taking all of that burden on himself. So this is actually the best service to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. To feel great compassion for the, to see the suffering living beings. It is a, everyone keep moving this way. <clears throat> so the more that one can render this most valuable of all services to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the more one becomes dear to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the more you become dear to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you will naturally feel great happiness. That is our actual happiness. To become very dear servitors of the Lord. So if we can learn how to feel compassion to see the suffering of others. This will help us to give up sense gratification. This will help us to fully absorb ourselves in devotional service for the benefit of all others.
Sense gratification beyond what is necessary is not a very good thing. It's a dirty thing, actually. Why? Because it contaminates the consciousness. Because we're not the body. We are not these senses. So if we overindulge the senses, we are simply reinforcing the false identification with this material body. And what is this material body? Everyone come, they need to make a space here. You need to move, the ladies move, you can move a little bit here so they can come to the door again. So it is this it is this identification with the material body which is the cause of all of our suffering. So anything which tightens or increases our misidentification with this material body is very inauspicious actually. It causes us to become unhappy. So we need to engage in activities which liberate us from the false conception with the material body. As much as possible. And there is no greater activity for freeing us from bodily consciousness than fully dedicating ourselves for the deliverance of all living beings. From their suffering condition. So if we can be in this mood, then our happiness will know no bounds. And no matter what may happen to us in this material existence, if we can keep this mood, then we will always feel that connection with Krishna and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Always living for the benefit of others. This is the mood which will bring us to complete happiness. Who is the perfect example of this? Balad Maharaj. He said, personally, I have no problem. I have fully dedicated myself to Lord Krishna, so I am completely free from problems. But my one problem is to see all these people who are not Krishna conscious. That is my great problem. And the greatest personification of compassion is one follower of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. His name is Vasudev Dutt. Vasudev Dutt, yeah. So this Vasudev Dutt, he said that I I want to take the sinful reactions of everyone throughout the whole universe on myself so they can become delivered. This Vasudev Dutt, he is more compassionate than Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, he was willing to take the sinful reactions of his disciples only. But this Vasudeva Datta, he is willing to take the karma of every single jiva throughout the whole universe so they can become saved. 
това са две врата и иска да приеме а, Таковите реакции на всяка една джива в цялата Вселена, за да се освободи. Това е Васудев, че той е най-компашният Вайшнав. Този Васудев е най-състрадателният Вайшнав. So this mood, the more we can be in the mood of serving others by delivering them from their entanglement within Maya. We will free a great happiness. To the extent that we want to gratify our own senses. Never mind what happens to others. That is called a miserly mentality. I do not know about your Bulgarian language. But in English language, the words are the same. A miser means a selfish person. And that miser, he must be miserable. It's the same word, miser and miser. Miserable miser. So it's a very simple formula. If you'd like to be miserable, just be a miser. Think about yourself. Do everything for yourself. Don't care about anyone else. And I guarantee you, you'll be miserable. And if you want to be, if you want to taste the sweetest happiness at every minute, then you should always be thinking, how can I live in such a way that I can become perfect and that everyone else can become inspired to become perfect? You see, we need to be ideal examples of Krishna consciousness. If we say, well, what can I do? I'm just a neophyte. No, we must stop being neophytes. There's, being neophyte may be an excuse for one or two days. But after that, it's time to get serious. We have to come off this neophyte platform. We have to learn how to become solidly fixed in Krishna consciousness. And the reward will be as described in this verse. We will always feel great happiness at every minute. In this mood of complete dedication to Krishna and the deliverance of all the living beings back to home, back to Godhead. It's an amazing, this is one of the most amazing statements I've ever read in Prabhupada's books actually. This person can sit silently in any place and simply enjoy the activities of life from within. He can be in the temple. He can be on a bus. He can be at work. He can be in any position and feel great happiness. Such a person sees everything within Krishna. And he sees Krishna within everything. This is the person we need to learn how to be. Okay, giving up our selfishness. And actually learning how to be good servants of the Vaishnavas. It's not easy to do for most of us. We've been selfish for millions of lifetimes. Always thinking, I am the center of all existence. So to give up that mentality overnight is not so easy thing. Mm-hmm. 
But if we will take shelter of the bona fide spiritual master, if we will strictly follow the rules and regulations of Bhakti Yoga, and we will sincerely try to the best of our ability to engage in Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement, then Lord Chaitanya and the Vaishnavas will be very kind upon us. And they will enable us to overcome this selfish, greedy mentality. And actually become useful instruments. In the hands of Sri Guru and Krishna. Sometimes we may laugh thinking it's impossible. <clears throat> actually Prabhupada did say that he said my disciples are like coal no matter how much you wash them they still come out dirty so what can we do we just have to pray the Guru and Krishna to save us from our dirt In other words, on our own, it's hopeless, it's useless. We can never become saved. If it's just up to us to control, you know, to perfectly control our senses, we would never have any hope of doing that. No way, no way. But by the mercy of Guru and Krishna, what is it stated? Mukam kuroti vachalam pangum lam yagate gidam Yat kripa tamahang vande shri guru nina taranam. By the mercy of the spiritual master, you see, mukam karoti vachalam. Even someone who can't speak, he can deliver eloquent speeches. Pangu lang yate gadim. And even the lame man. He can cross over a mountain. So spiritually we are lame. You see, we may not be able to explain the Vedic wisdom very nicely. But by the Guru of Krishna we can deliver eloquent speeches. And when it comes to practical devotional service, we are very, very lame to do it properly. We're always making so many mistakes, isn't it? But by the mercy of Guru and Krishna, even an incompetent nitwit, like you and me, you see, we can become expert in devotional service. We simply have to take the shelter of Guru and Krishna, that's all. That will make us strong. That will make us steady. That will make us fixed up Vaishnavas. Even though it seems impossible sometimes that we could ever become fixed up Vaishnavas. It seems absolutely impossible sometimes. <laughs> it seems impossible, doesn't it, sometimes, that we could ever be fixed up? I mean, we're so flaky, you know. <laughs> Just like a dog with a crooked tail, you know. You keep straightening it out, but again it becomes crooked again. So we like them. Like dog with crooked tails. But by the mercy of Guru and Krishna, even the impossible thing, it can happen. Actually, Prabhupada is confirmed. He said, impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. 
So do not think it is impossible that you can become a pure devotee. You think it is impossible, you are a fool, that's all. So we must not remain fools. We have to remember the example of that little sparrow. You know the little sparrow? You don't know the little sparrow. <laughs> I will tell you the story of the little sparrow, yes. <clears throat> this little sparrow, she laid her eggs. And then the rascal ocean, uh, to harass that little bird, he stole the eggs of the sparrow. So you know the mother is very attached to the children. So she begged the ocean, you give back the eggs. The ocean said, no. You can't have them. Ha, ha, ha. So the sparrow became very angry and very determined. That I will get back those eggs. So she went running down to the ocean. She took some drops of water in her little beak out of the ocean. And then she went running back to the land. And she deposited that ocean water on the dry land. Then she went running back down to the ocean. She took some more ocean water in her beak. She went back running to the dry land. So in this way, back and forth, back and forth, she was determined, I will dry up that ocean. And of course, everyone was laughing. <laughs> Just see that stupid bird. Everyone was making fun of this little stupid, like they said stupid little bird, you see. Nobody had compassion. The poor bird, her eggs were stolen. They were just making fun of her in a very cruel way, you see. But do you know, in the bird family, there are many varieties of birds. And you know there is one king of the birds. Who is the king of the birds? Who can say who is the king of the birds? Garuda. He is full of all mystic power. He is the carrier of Lord Vishnu. So when Garuda heard, the ocean has stolen the eggs from my little sister. And she is trying to get back the, her eggs. And everyone is laughing at my little sister. And they are making fun of my little sister. He became full of anger. And he came swooping in. And he told the ocean, you better give those eggs back right now. Or I will destroy you with my mystic power. In the ocean went <laughs> to give the eggs back, you see. Garuda has the power. Within a second he can destroy the entire ocean. So what is the sparrow got her eggs back? So what is the moral of the story? They say that every good story has a moral, you see. 
So, what is the moral of the story? God helps those who help themselves. So, do you want to become fixed in Krishna Bhakti? Do you want to become happy? Do you want to become free from all my anxiety? Therefore, you must make the endeavor to become Krishna conscious. Do not remain Godas or Godasi, simply the servant of your senses. Become the master of your senses. Goswami. Goswamini. <laughs> Become the master of your senses. You see. Make the endeavor to bring your senses under control just as that sparrow made the endeavor. And if you do so, you will get help from Guru from the Vaishnavas, from Lord Chaitanya, from all the Vaishnavacharyas, and from Krishna himself. You will get all help. Simply make that endeavor to become Krishna conscious. To get free from all of your dirt Why are we so attached to that dirt? Does it make any sense? Why be attached to the dirt? It's like some people, they don't like to bathe very often. My student here, Carlos, he said his father, Carlos, how often did your father bathe? Every six months he would take bath, yes. So, he was very attached to the dirt. That I will bathe once every six months, you see. But we should not be attached to the dirt. We should be attached to being clean. Therefore, the Vaishnava Brahman, upon rising in the morning, he immediately takes his bath. He does not like to be dirty. He wants to get rid of the dirt, you see. So, in this way, we have to give up this attachment to the dirt. You may say, I take bath every morning, so I'm okay. But there's another bath you have to take also. Do you know what that is? other bath is? Manasnam. You have to bathe your mind also. That's why every day we chant at least 16 rounds of Hare Krishna Mantra. That's to cleanse the mind. Simply cleansing the body, that is not enough. You must also cleanse your mind. Because the mind is dirty. It is contaminated with the desire to lord it over this material existence. It is contaminated by the thought that I am the center of existence. Everything is for my enjoyment. This is the contamination confirmed by Vishnu Priya Manaji. <laughs> this is the contamination. Each and every one of us are thinking we are the center of existence. 
that I am the be all and end all of existence, me. Even though we know that Krishna is God, and that we are his eternal servants, still we act as if we were God, you see. You understand? Even though we know better, we still walk around, we still strut around as if we are God, you see. Even when we're associating with devotees, we act like I am the Supreme, you see. I am the Supreme and you are my subordinate, you see. That's how we act. That's why Prabhupada taught us how to address the devotees. Prabhu, you see, you are my master. You see. And he told us to address the women as mother because that means I'm your son and you are my superior. Whether we say Prabhu or Mataji, that is my superior person, I am under you, you see. If you are my mother, then I am your son. You are my superior and I am your servant, you see, if you are my mother. So whether we say Prabhu or Maraji, they are both the same. They are both Prabhus, they are both masters. So we have to act like that. That you are my Prabhu, you are my master. I must please you and I must serve you. Someone may think, well, the spiritual master, he's, he has it good, he doesn't have to do them. He gets to walk around and be the master. But I can guarantee you one thing. The spiritual master thinks like that, he won't last very long. He will fall down very quickly. The only person who is actually qualified to be a spiritual master is that person who sincerely feels that he is some humble servant of all the devotees. That's the only person who can really be a proper spiritual master. Someone who thinks that I am superior to you. He's not qualified to be a spiritual master. Only that person who thinks that I am your servant. I'm your humble servant. That person is qualified to be no no. So this is a very nice verse They're telling us how we can always relish the sweetest happiness at every minute. If we can fully understand and apply this verse in purport, It will be a great revolution in consciousness within our heart. And with such a transformed heart, we will be able to do the greatest good for all living beings. In this way, we can become fully Krishna conscious. And we can spread this Krishna Kanyas movement like anything. So we have to learn this art. This art known as true humility. Because it is then and only then that we can actually chant Hare Krishna Mantra. Trinadapi sunnichena Tororapi sahishnuna Amanina manadena Kirtaniya sadahari 
Only if we can truly develop this humble spirit. Will we be able to taste the holy name? And if we don't taste the pleasure of the holy name, how long we can go on making a show of being a devotee? One year, two years, three years. How long we can go on making a show of being a devotee if we are not tasting the nectar of the name? Sooner or later we will fall down. You can't go on as a dancing dog forever. We have to actually relish the name. And that relish can only happen when we develop genuine humility. So we have to understand there is nothing more important for each and every one of us to do than to develop genuine humility. That is the greatest necessity. There is no greater necessity than the development of humility. So, now I can ask if there's any questions. Yeah. Uh, Guru Dev, how can we um, develop more compassion for the living beings? Как можем да развиваме повече състезание по живите същества? One very effective technique for developing compassion is to see from your own experience how miserable it is to not be Krishna conscious. If you can remember how much you were suffering when you did not have Krishna consciousness, then you can understand what they are going through. That's why it's always good to remember how miserable it was before you became Krishna conscious. Next question. In order to develop true humility, does it help to to act in a humble way? Yes. No. Fake it until you make it. Even if you're angry and you're puffed up and you're conceited and you're proud, bite your lips and keep it within. Act as you should act. And that will pull the genuine humility which is buried deep within the false ego. That will pull it out. It will extract it. That's the meaning of sadhana bhakti. You don't have the taste, but act as act properly according to duty. And by acting according to duty, even though taste is not there, gradually the taste will come out. I have many times given that example, you may remember, of Gargamuni Prabhu. In the early days at 26 Second Avenue, uh, when, when they called him Swamiji then, Prabhupada was called Swamiji. In the 26 Second Avenue, there's a door which goes into a hallway, and then that hallway goes into a little courtyard. 
And across the courtyard, there's a door which goes into an apartment building and then up the stairs on the second floor of his Prabhupada's apartment. So Srila Prabhupada would come down the stairs, through the doorway, across the courtyard, into the hall, and into the doorway. And when Swamiji would enter, all the devotees would bow down. And when the Guru comes, every disciple bows on the floor, you see. They would all bow down. But one devotee, he didn't. He would not bow down. I don't know if he was, he probably wasn't initiated, I don't know, but he was not bowing down. And so when it came time for the questions, he raised his hand. He said, Swamiji, when you come into the room, everyone bows down. But for me, it does not seem natural. <laughs> so I do not bow down. Is that all right, Swamiji? <laughs> he wanted permission to not bow down. So. <laughs> so what did Prabhupada tell him? He said, you should bow down. Because by bowing down, then the feeling will come. So, Gargamuni, he surrendered to Prabhupada's instruction. And it worked. He developed the feeling to bow down. So even you don't feel like being humble. Even you feel like yelling at someone. Yes. Or hitting them. Just control it. Act as a humble Vaishnava. And then the natural humble feelings, they will come. So fake it until you make it. Faking works, actually, in Krishna consciousness. Act as if you're an actual Krishna conscious devotee. On the basis of duty. And then the spontaneous, natural Vaishnava qualities will become prominent in your heart. And you will finally feel it. It won't be artificial. You will feel genuine humility. And when you become genuinely humble, you can spread this movement by like anything. You become a powerful preacher. So develop this humility. Lord Jesus Christ says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So if you become humble, you will become a great spiritual leader actually on this planet. By your example, you will be able to inspire so many people to become Krishna conscious. So everyone should try to develop this genuine humility. It brings great power and potency. I agree, fake it to make it. But when trying to develop uh, humility and not doing their duty, is that isn't that the opposite reactions? <clears throat> I had just explained that one should do one's duty. One should act dutifully. In that way, develop the humility. The duty, what I'm referring it to, like Prabhupada would have remained humbly and not instructed correctly. So that how is would the person would understand ha, ha. that this is right That's right. Now, it is the duty of the senior Vaishnavas 
to give instructions and as a friend. If we tell the senior devotee, you, you shouldn't, you should just be humble, you shouldn't correct me. You see, that is not the idea. If you chastise the senior devotee, he says, why have you done that? You shouldn't have done that. And then you say, you're not being humble, Prabhu. <laughs> why are you disturbed? You should just be humble. No, no, they're not like that. Actually, Prabhupada says, if a Brahman becomes, if a, if a senior devotee becomes angry at you, you should pacify him with a humble attitude and a smiling face. So if a senior devotee becomes disturbed at our misbehavior, that's a great blessing upon him, actually. That is a great mercy if a senior devotee becomes angry and corrects us. But then the devotee, senior devotee is not acting to develop their humility. No, that's not true. No, 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 no. That's not true. So she is making the argument that if the senior devotee corrects the junior devotee, then he is acting in such a way as to not develop his own humility. But that is incorrect. That's in relationship with those who are with your equals and those who are in a position to correct you. If you're in a if you're a senior devotee, you have a responsibility to train the those who are younger devotees. Between the equals also, isn't that? Huh? Between the equals. Yes, also between equals. If you're wrong, it gets more tricky when you're dealing with equals. Because if there, one says one thinks he is right and he should correct the other one. The other thinks he is right and he should correct the other one. So who will decide? That's the problem, you see. That's the difficulty. But the results can make it out, isn't it? Translation. Not the translation. Mm-hmm. See, it's actually the duty, if you are right and someone else is wrong, it's your duty to correct them. So that's where it gets tricky, you see. Because I think that I'm right and you're wrong. And you think that you're right and I'm wrong. So I feel it's my duty, to, my rightful duty to correct you. And you feel that it's your rightful duty to correct me. So this is when, this is when it, this is the real test if you're really Krishna conscious or not. Teshang satadi yuktanam vajatang prati puravakam dadami budi yogam tam yena mamupiyanti te. Yes? Okay. Here, some facilities here, some facilities there. 
you know, preaching goes somehow, you just distribute, you know, a few books a week or something. So I consider it faking. But you might, have, you it might have to translate? Yeah. So could you please make it, it make a shorter yeah. segment so he doesn't lose it. Give him enough where he can translate. Maybe he, he can do oh, you can translate. Yeah. Okay. So, Good. Uh, How do you, how does one fake it without, huh? Yeah, like, we may, we may be satisfied by faking it without any big results, actually. In our personal, like, proper... No, I'm saying, it. my point is this. You have to act according to duty, even if the feeling is not there. That's what I mean. Even if you don't feel like getting up from Mangalarti, you must get up anyway. That's the point. Even if you don't feel like going out and distributing Prabhupada's books, you should go anyway, out of duty. That's the point. My point is, you should act out of duty even if the feeling is not there. So that is actually a very genuine thing to do. <coughs> it's not faking it in the material sense of being dishonest. No. It, is, uh, it is acknowledging, well, I don't really have those feelings yet, but still I know my duty, so let me act according to my duty. I don't feel any compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. But my spiritual master wants me to preach, so I must do that on his order. By acting in this way, in a dutiful way, then all the feelings will gradually come, the natural feelings will come. One will feel like getting up every morning at 4 o'clock and having Mangalarti at the temple or at home, it doesn't matter. If one does it as a matter of duty, and then gradually all the natural feelings will be there. But I don't think we fully answered her query yet. It got sidetracked a little bit. We're going to get back to it. So what do you do when there's two equals and they both one feel they both feel that the other one that they are right and the other one's wrong? Well the worst thing that can happen is a fight. <laughs> Prabhupada said do not fight. So the best thing to do is always take the humble position. If another devotee, if your equal, thinks that you are wrong, then you should just you should shut up and hear. Try to understand how is it that you are wrong. There's a saying where there is smoke, there is fire. So even if the way you're being corrected is not completely correct, there's something in that correction which is correct, and that you should try to understand. So if one is in that mood of always trying to take whatever correction is given, then one will make very nice progress. One has to see that Krishna has arranged this situation for me. For some reason, I've been put into these circumstances. Krishna is trying to tell me something by this situation which is happening right now. 
If every devotee tries to see that everything is within Krishna and Krishna is within everything, then all of the relationships between the Vaishnavas become perfect. It's a simple thing. Be Krishna conscious. At every step. Let my every thought, let my every word, and let my every action be pleasing to Krishna. If we are introspective, we're always analyzing our own thoughts, our own words, and our own actions to make sure that they are Krishna conscious and everything will work perfectly. Actually, Prabhupada said, a gentleman thinks twice before speaking anything. <coughs> so if we just blurt things out of our mouth without thought, that leads to fight. So we have to learn how to be reserved. And not just to speak words out without proper thoughtfulness. That's a thing. Actually, that person who is, is our well wisher, they are qualified to correct us. That person who is always wishing us well, they are qualified to correct us. So I don't know if we fully satisfied you yet. <laughs> because I just feel that uh, taking those roles, maybe becoming trying to become humble, as you said about the spiritual master, uh, is the servant, and the servant is not meant to guide anybody. And if he takes up a role of... Oh, no, 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 no. You're saying... So, when the spiritual master does not guide and he feels that he's a servant, he may be a servant in a different manner, but he may not guide, then it is hurting <clears throat> to the other person. And so similarly, anyone who does not tell that this is right and this is wrong, that means he are, they are hurting those people. So, the I can be translation. Conscious. I can be Krishna conscious. And uh, not say anything. I can develop my like. Yeah, let him translate it, one piece at a time. Okay. Okay. So that um, that means a person who does not speak up and just try to say, "I'm meant to be. I'm meant to be humble." Then they are not doing the right service for the dear person. I, I have to develop my Krishna consciousness. In Krishna consciousness, I must think, I must not say something. I must not do this. Then the, um, we are doing this service for the other person. Translation. That we see day-to-day life. If you are in a it is an incorrect idea to think that being humble means that I cannot guide someone or I cannot correct them. It stated the spiritual master who does not chastise his disciples is their enemy. So for the guru and for senior devotees, that is a service, that is a duty they have, especially for the spiritual master. Spiritual master must chastise his disciples. If he doesn't do so, he is their enemy, he is not their well wisher. So that is service. If someone corrects me when I'm doing something wrong, they are doing me the greatest service. 
някой му коригира, когато беше нещо неправилно, те оказват най-голямата услуга. We heard one class in Mumbai, Juhu. The devotee was speaking very nicely. He said if someone criticizes you, you should, you should invite them to move in with you, to live with you. We should be very eager to have the association of that person who points out our faults. That person is our, our genuine well-wisher. So when a senior devotee does not point out the faults, he is doing a disservice. If he remains silent, that is called artificial humility. Humility doesn't mean, you know, Om Tat Sat. That is not humility. Humility means to do what is beneficial for that person, to help them get out of the cycle of birth and death. That is humility. So, Shila, when Srila Prabhupada uh, was in, uh, blasted us with his anger, that was the greatest humble service. Sometimes he would show so much anger, his lips would quiver. He could show such extreme anger. Was that was Prabhupada not humble when he was showing that anger? Actually, Prabhupada told that actually he's never angry with us, but he has to show that anger to teach us. One time there was a late night program. Mm-hmm. And then for the following morning at Mangal Arti, nobody showed up. So in the Bhagavatam class, Prabhupada chastised the devotees like anything. They were shaking. So severely he chastised them. Chastised, chastised, chastised. They were dev- emotionally devastated by his anger. So then, after the class, Prabhupada walked out the door with the temple president, Chitsukananda Prabhu. Chitsukananda Prabhu, he felt that he was Prabhupada's little puppy dog. He always liked to follow Prabhupada around wherever he went. <laughs> so he walked with Prabhupada out the door. This was in Mexico. So there was some nice, it's a tropical climate, some beautiful tropical, aromatic tropical flowers were growing just outside the doorway on the wall. So he picked one to Prabhupada, for Prabhupada, he gave it to him. And Prabhupada smelled it in just the most peaceful, serene mood of, of uh, enjoying, you know, relishing the nice flower, you see. Prabhupada had been roaring like the Shringa Bhagavan, you see. And now he was just completely like a swan, completely peaceful and serene, you see. In one minute, he switched from one mood to the other. And Chitsukananda Prabhu was so amazed. He said, Prabhupada, you were like Nishinga, you were roaring like a lion, you were so angry. And now you're so calm and peaceful. How is that possible, Srila Prabhupada? Prabhupada said, actually, I'm never angry at you, my beloved disciples. But I have to show that anger to train you. 
<laughs> so the 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 spiritual master actually is never angry at his disciples. But he has to make convince them that he is angry. <laughs> so they get scared. <laughs> and get serious. He has to convince them that he's really angry and I've just created the ultimate opera and, and my spiritual life can be finished in a minute if I don't do something to rectify my fallen consciousness. So in this way, he's doing the greatest service by blasting the hell out of them. But it is simply in the mood of loving service that he's doing that. And if he doesn't do that, he is their enemy. When they do wrong, and if he doesn't say something, he is their enemy. So the spiritual master has to be expert at chastising his disciples in the appropriate time, place and circumstances. The day-to-day life amongst the devotees. The devotees should be very honest. If they see something that's going wrong, they should say something. Not that everything is okay, like the Mayavadis. As many paths, as many opinions, everything is okay. I am okay, you're okay, everything is okay. That is not the Buddha. In Mayapur, they built some uh, toilets for the uh, the Bengali uh, the Bengali workers in the Mayapur project. They were used, that was for the Maya, the Bengali workers those toilets. But they weren't used to using toilets. They were villagers. They would go out into the field for passing stool, you see. So they didn't know what is this flushing, you see. They were just used to the field. So the toilet was completely horrible, stool everywhere, and some horrible mess. And, and Prabhupada came on his morning walk. He said, what is this? And devotees tried to give so many excuses, you see. Why are they not cleaning the toilets? And they said, well, Prabhupada, it's the Japa period. Everyone's chanting their rounds. <laughs> Prabhupada said, in the plea of Japa, they were remaining filthy. Yes. So, actually, Prabhupada, he came to the Bhagavatam class. He again brought up the point of the dirty toilets. He said, if you see something which is wrong and you do not say anything about it, then you are guilty of of that thing. In other words, if there is some some tamasic thing is happening, you see, motive ignorance thing, like a dirty bathroom, and you totally ignore it, like everything is okay, no problem, no problem. Then by your accepting that dirty thing <coughs> as being okay, you become personally dirty. So in this way, we have to all take responsibility on behalf of Prabhupada movement. That everything should be going on very nicely. Mm-hmm. Everyone should take responsibility. Not just the GBC and the gurus and the sannyasis. 
Everybody should take responsibility for this movement. That it's going on properly. Prabhupada liked to give the example of Indian railways. They had a poster. This poster said, it is the duty of every employee of India Railways to see that the wheel on the train is turning. So you may ask, well, how every employee can do that? There is only one employee that sits in the engine and turns, does the throttle for the train to move forward. Only one employee does that. How they can say that every employee must see that the wheel is turning down the track? But actually every employee is responsible. The one employee has to sign some document. Another employee has to do this and that. Every employee is connected with the forward motion of that train down the track. So we should not say, well, that's the GBC's responsibility. If you are a member of this movement, it is your duty to see that this movement is moving forward to saving the following conditions. So, don't try to pass the buck. Each member must take responsibility to see that this movement is going forward. By this cooperative effort of we all working together to make this movement a success. That's how we will be successful. Any other questions? Did that satisfy your query now? Or still unsatisfied? What do you mean by that? That this the, the, the answer to Narada must be to, to fake it, uh, fake it and to make it. So there can be some someone senior, like say for for example, like in the family life. So the husband is always senior. So wife says fake it out to be humble and never say a word and keep everything within herself. That was my point. <coughs> this is kind of example. Yes, yes. So both principles are there. There, are, there is, a, there are those situations like between the, the disciple and the spiritual master. The disciple and spiritual master is quite different than the right. family relationship right. and the devotee relationship. Right. right. I was talking about when the spiritual master corrects the disciple. That is another matter. That, yes, that yes. naturally, the disciple becomes humble towards the spiritual master. But what about within the family members, within that um, friend's circle? That was my question. <coughs> but between the, and the family members, yeah, the then they family. both have to take instruction from each other, actually. Just like when uh, one reporter said, Swamiji, I have heard that in your movement the men are considered superior and the women follow. Is that correct? And Srila Prabhupada said, No. She said, did the men, he said, is it true that the men give the orders and the women follow? That was her question. Srila Prabhupada said, no, we follow the orders of Krishna, men and women both. So, this is how we operate. We, we have to always see, are we, are we acting for Krishna? It is the husband's duty to see that the, the the family members are acting for the pleasure of Krishna. 
And it is equally the duty of the wife also. It is her, equally her duty as well to see that the family members are acting for the pleasure of Krishna. Is that clear? I was just trying to make it clear for everybody. All right, all right. It's not that I need to... Right. But as I explained it clearly that everyone will understand. That's what I... I know that you understand. But is it clear for everyone to understand? In your opinion? All right, let me ask you all. Is it clear for everyone to understand? Yes. Narada Muni Prabhu. He has a question. All right. His question is so uh, he himself is an older person, elderly person, so he's almost uh, convinced that there is no happiness in this world. But what about why the, almost? Why are you not fully convinced? <laughs> this is this is actually the question: how to to give up this hope against hope? That's all others again uh, around me. They are miserable, but but maybe I I will become happy. So this is a hope. How to give up this false hope that you can enjoy the material world? <laughs> Others may be miserable, but I, I, I may become happy. Ahani ahani bhutani ganshanti alamalyam shesha shtavar michchami kim mushchami mataha phadam. You were seeing around you that everyone else is dying, but you were thinking, not me. You see, everyone else is suffering, but I will enjoy. This is a great illusion. You're not seeing that death is there waiting to jump on you at any minute. There is nothing more wonderful than this. You were thinking that you can enjoy that at any minute your death will come and smash your, take your enjoyment away immediately. So, you must become sober. <laughs> you must realize the words of Krishna. Abrahma Bhuvana Loka Punaravartinarjuna Mamu Pechita Kaunteya Punarjanmana Vijite. It is simply misery. No matter what neighborhood you live here, live in here in Sofia, whether you live in a fancy, uh, a rich mansion or a shack, every place is miserable. Whether you live in the French Riviera or you live in the ghetto of Berlin, whether you live in a New York City penthouse, or whether you live in a Georgia ghetto. It is, the whole place is miserable. I don't care if you go to Brahma Loka. I don't care if you become Brahmaji himself. Or you're a worm in the, the Krimi Bhojana. Every place is simply misery. Why do you think there is some enjoyment here? Why are you so foolish you think there is some enjoyment here? When will you kick this stupid idea out of your brain? When will you do them? Why are you holding on to this stupid idea? Stupido. Stupidissimo. 
you see. You must give up this false idea. You must hear the words of the Acharyas and take seriously this pathway of Krishna Bhakti. Any other questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> we'll have another hour's worth of controversy. Go ahead. <laughs> no, she's a... It's her turn now. You have to wait. Determination of the sparrow. So, if we are really determined about <coughs> rectifying our mistakes, so, uh, those are correct that Mukham told us that we can only follow the mm, words of the spiritual world. We can do so many things. <coughs> and determination of the sparrow is also correct. <coughs> and it can work. So my question is this, that if we are really determined like squirrel, would we go on making the mistakes, same mistakes again and again? No. <laughs> so why do we keep doing that? We are not as determined as the sparrow, that's fine. We haven't learned our lesson yet. <laughs> Simple then. What is the hope? We have to accept the sparrow as our guru. By learning from her example. Yes. I see so many young people here and I wonder why why there are a uh, few people in the temple and here are much more. Why people here are more than the temple? Is there a class at the temple tonight? That's why. If I was giving a lecture at the temple tonight, there would be more people at the temple than there would be here. They have come to hear transcendental nectar. Because there's no class at the temple, but there's class here, therefore they have come here instead. Any other questions? Yeah. She, uh, regarding the correcting the other devotees, uh, she has heard that uh, if you try to correct someone, uh, whom you know will not take will not take your advice and it will make the, it even worse then uh, what should you do should you nevertheless correct him or? you should become more expert <laughs> how to to be able to correct them and get away with doing it nicely <laughs> if they need correction and you know they need it and no one else is doing it, then you better learn how to do it. That's all. You should increase your own humility and your own power of bhakti so you can correct them successfully and they'll take it.
you are not my authority. Oh, and that's like saying, let the GVC solve all the problems, you know. Just pass the buck. Now, I want to see an ISKCON where every devotee takes a responsibility that everything is going right. That's the ISKCON I want to see. One may take that responsibility, but um, sometimes we see that when take that responsibility, trying to do that, they may be expert or may not be expert, but if it's not their position, they do it, and then uh, the other thing that I, you are not my authority, I don't want to listen to you. So then that person moves away, and their Krishna consciousness is hampered. That means she's not expert enough, that's what it means. Expert enough means that you develop your own power of humility to the extent that other people are very eager to take your instructions. That's what it means. You should be some, become so Krishna conscious that people are eager to receive your instructions. That they will take it as a blessing that you correct them. <coughs> you have to develop very good relationships. Loving and trusting relationships. You see, you see if I love someone and I trust them, even if they correct me, I'll immediately think, oh, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Immediately I feel lightly, you see. <coughs> If I love someone and I trust them, even if they correct me, then I will take it. So how how that loving feeling can, can be developed? How, you, in other words, if people love you, they will take your instructions. So how will you get people to love you? It's a very simple formula. You simply have to love them. <clears throat> Sanatana Goswami in Vrindavan. You see. Every, even the ordinary householder uh, engaged in mundane activities. It's like there would be a fight between the husband and wife. Of course, you don't have fights between your husband and wives here in Sofia, do you? <laughs> no fights here, right? <laughs> anyway, now, sometimes in the Vrijabasi, husbands and wives, they would have fights. <clears throat> so they would go to Sanatana, husband and wife would come together to Sanatana Goswami. And the husband would give his side and the wife would give his her side. And Sanatana Goswami, he would make judgment. You are right and you are wrong. And they had so much faith and love in Sanatana Goswami. Whatever he said, they would take it, you see. And therefore, Srinivasacharya, he has sung, Dira Dira Jana Priyo Priyakaro. You see. These Goswamis, they were dear to everyone. So how do they become dear to everyone? By force? No, because they loved everyone. They felt genuine love in their hearts for every living being. Therefore, everyone loved them. So the only person who is actually qualified to correct someone is that person who truly loves the person they are correcting. If I hate somebody, I'm not qualified to correct them. I'm only qualified to correct those persons that I truly love. 
Но коригирам само тези решки, които наистина обичам. So that's the formula. If you want to correct someone, you must first love them. And then your correction will be taken as loving. If it truly is loving, it will be taken as loving. But if it's, if it's tinged with pride and arrogance, it may not be taken the same way. Of course, sometimes even when we give loving correction to others, they still don't take it. Prabhupada also had that trouble. He wanted to instruct sometimes, but the disciples couldn't take it from him. Just like one boy, he was keeping beard. <clears throat> he actually came to India. And that made it even worse because all the Indians were seeing here's a disciple with a beard. So Prabhupada was trying to figure, he was trying to think of some tactful way to instruct the disciple that he would take it. So even Prabhupada sometimes had difficulty instructing his disciples because of their material attachments. So sometimes you have to become very clever and intelligent to think, let me find a way to, to give this person the correction they need, very tactfully and expertly. In the right place, at the right time, in exactly the right situation, in the right in the right tone of voice. So that they will take it. This would this would means become expert at correcting, you see. <clears throat> Any other questions? Аз майско за темата, ама аз мисля, че всъщност в обществото навън хората също си имат такива съветници и се обръщат към тях за съвети и искат от тях съвети, те им дават съвети, дори ние сме имали такива личности, към които предполагам, че много от нас са обръщали за съвети, са тия личности с едни от най-плютите и смисъл навън се случва много често някакви пастори или не да се книга да падат и хората си падат по Дел Карнеги и някакви такива съветници в кавички. В смисъл това, това също е един интересен момент, който е интересно. Не е просто всеки, да, всеки се търси някой, който, да, който той да чувства, че го обича или някакво негово разбиране за подходящ съветник. Въобще не бях синтезираш на кратко. Аз като колкото разбрах, да дали трябва да всъщност да приеме съвети от това. Не, 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 не. Или как а, дали всеки си търси този, който най- най-лесно ще намери пътя към сърцето му така. Да, примерно, смисъл, не, 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 че всеки според някакво своя ниво на, на това колко е готов да възприема да се търси съвети. Isn't it that each one of us, according to his level or his... Uh, okay, well, in, in the society outside, uh, there are people who, who like mundaners, that... Uh, people accept as their advisors and they turn for advice to, to them. Like, you know, Del Carnegie or some, I don't know, Reverend uh, Johnson or someone. And I, I guess we all had such persons in, most of us had such persons in our previous lives. And uh, we see that they're, they're not in the best position to give advices, though we feel in a way that they can give advices to us. Okay. So my question is basically, uh, isn't it like we're searching, or even devotees are searching for such advisors that uh, will actually advise us what we 
expect or advisors that will fit our level. Yeah. <clears throat> We want people who can advise us in such a way that our life becomes transformed. Then we become happy. Then we become peaceful. Then we become successful. Actually, people pay tons of money to get advice on how they can improve their lives. That's the thing. So the preachers of the Hare Krishna movement, they are supposed to be the persons who are the most qualified to give advice how to become happy, peaceful and successful. So we have to do our duty. We have to become qualified to play that role for the human society. That is the position of the Brahmana. He is, as Prabhupada explains, he is the spiritual master of the human society. So we are giving Brahman initiation. It is not simply a ritual. Brahman initiation means you must become qualified to guide the entire human society. You must develop all the qualities given for the Brahmana in Bhagavad Gita. Controlling the mind, controlling the senses. <clears throat> In this way, becoming peaceful, becoming tolerant. Theoretical knowledge of scripture and practical application of scripture. Everything must be there. And this is when our movement will finally become successful on this planet. When our members become actually qualified Brahmins, then the entire world will come to us to learn how to become happy, successful and peaceful. Individually and collectively. Srila Prabhupada said that day will come when you will become the leaders of the world. He said, it is not difficult. You simply must act with the sincerity and intelligence. And then Krishna will help. So that we must do. We must become sincere and we must become intelligent. Speak up. <clears throat> well, in Shastra it said that uh, even if one who is in, even if one not engaged in devotional service to Krishna uh, has all kinds of good qualities, uh, actually he doesn't have 
even one good quality because he's not a good person. Yeah. But uh, in our society, we see people who are uh, <coughs> thinking that we have to turn to external so-called authorities because we're lacking emotional or psychological uh, background in our own philosophy or our own books, in our own community or society. So what would you comment on that? <laughs> What would Prabhupada say? That's the question. <clears throat> Prabhupada said, everything you need to know is in my books. So, if someone thinks otherwise... That means they are deviating from Srila Prabhupada. And, uh, one more question. Uh, several days ago, I came across a question addressed to Anis Khan Guru, and I would like to hear your... Speak louder. Yeah. Like okay, to, go ahead. I would like to hear what would you answer All right. the question. So we have principles in our society that we can... We have regulative principles and we have rules and regulations that we can just get rid of them or make compromise with them. But on the other side, we have personalities that are not always fit to, to those rules and regulations. So my question is whether, well, which one is most more important, the personality, the individuals, the individual devotees, or the, or the rules and regulations, or what is the balance between both? So, the people are more important. <laughs> Do you think I will reject you if you break the rules and regulations? you think I will throw you out the door if you break the rules and regulations? Did Prabhupada ever do that? Even they broke the rules and relations, they came back. I agree it was breaking so many rules and regulations with smoking the marijuana, you see. And when he came back, Prabhupada would cry tears of affection for his son, I agree with. <laughs> Prabhupada saw the person. So why the rules and regulations now? Because that helps that person to become free from anxiety and become happy. And the people are always more important than the rules. But the rules are also very important because that's the only way that you can become happy. Is this the international society for rules and regulations? <laughs> Or is it the international society for Krishna consciousness? <laughs> Which is it? <laughs> I ask R and R <laughs> Khan Irkan Irshir Khan or how do you say it? Irshir Khan or Iskan? This is the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So we want we, we want you to follow the rules so that you become Krishna conscious. That's all. You are more important than the rules. Because we love you, we want you to follow the rules because that will make you happy. So the person is always more important, but the rule is there to help that person become happy. So then, should we condone some rules and regulations if that people will be more important? For example, there is one rule, no illicit sex. This rule is a hard rule to follow for many people. Some brahmacharis break the rule by masturbation. 
някои брадочари нарушават това правило като мастурбират. Even some gurus fell down and had sex for their disciples. And the householders, they sometimes have sex other than for procreation. So for everyone, most most everyone has a very difficult time with this rule, no illicit sex. So we should say, well, let's make it take it a little easy and, you know, it's okay, you know. People are more important than rules. So that's all right. Go ahead and have sex. You know. Prabhupada's mercy, you know. Well, it's okay. Is that our philosophy? No. But the, just like in the initiation ceremony uh, the previous time, One of the ladies, when I said, what are the four regulations? She said, no sex outside of marriage. <laughs> I immediately said, no, right in the initiation ceremony. I immediately stopped the ceremony and said, no, that is not correct. <laughs> that is not our philosophy. <laughs> Our philosophy, our Prabhupada is very clearly stated and there is also a verse in the Bhagavatam which says exactly the same thing, the 11th canto. It is not Prabhupada's invention. It is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam itself. That sex should only be utilized for producing saintly children, otherwise strict celibacy. So this is a very strong point. <clears throat> we do not excommunicate members who have difficulties, but we do train them how to follow these principles. That's it. <coughs> we do train everyone. <clears throat> No illicit sex means no illicit sex. If a person, a devotee, uh, is in a situation that he works or studies some uh, job, Uh, uh, which involves uh, reading of some um, um, side literature, like, for example, psychology or something. Oh, that's all right. For your job, it's okay. No problem. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. And, and this even helps to distribute the, the message of uh, Krishna consciousness and the distribution of the books. If, if this is even helpful. I don't understand. If uh, reading these things is helping in the, in the preaching, how would that help? It helps in distributing in distributing more books to how? people. How? How would it help? Tell me how it helps. Through associating with other people <coughs> on the basis of this other knowledge. This is, this is the job, actually. Oh, it's in your job for your livelihood. For livelihood, it's okay. Whatever you have to do to make livelihood. Just don't be a butcher, that's all. (laughs) For livelihood, whatever. And if you can feel your livelihood, you can also preach, and that's very good. That's very nice. Just like when I was working in jobs some years ago. <clears throat> um, I decided I would wear T-lock to my job. I was doing telemarketing. I was selling things over the telephone. So that day when I wore T-lock, 
I sold like anything. I had many sales that day. And the manager was so enlivened. <laughs> He said, I don't know what that is that you're wearing, but you must wear it every day. <laughs> so, and if you can find ways to introduce Krishna consciousness at your work, that's very good. You can put a picture of Krishna and Prabhupada and your Guru Maharaj on the desk. I have one godbrother, he was working a corporate job in the USA. So he would keep a Bhagavad Gita on his desk, you know, with a picture. Very colorful Bhagavad Gita on his desk. And one of the co-workers, he was innocent. What is that book? So the co-worker read that book and he became a devotee. So you can put a picture of Krishna on your desk, picture of Prabhupada, you can have a Bhagavad Gita, you can have a some stack of books to give out to people who are interested, prasadam, so many things you can do. Mm-hmm. Now but you can preach from where, where you're earning your living, it's very nice. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? So everything's answered now. All the questions are answered. Everything's crystal clear how to become purely Krishna conscious. How we can save the whole world now. It's all clear. <laughs> Everyone's got it all down, ready to become a pure devotee and become a spiritual revolutionary. All right. <clears throat> What is according to you uh, community building based on? Love and trust. If I love you and I trust you, then we can work together and build a community. If I hate you and I don't trust you, then we can never work together, isn't it? It's like I have love and trust with certain devotees, just based on my dealing with them. I have love and trust in them. And because that love and trust, we can do things together cooperatively. And by doing that, our love and trust becomes even stronger and then we can do even more together. So just find some way that you can do something along with the devotee. Even if you have no love and trust in them, find some way that you can do something together with them, even some little thing together with them. And that will plant the seed of love and trust that can gradually grow over time, you see. Because we cannot work together as a community unless we have love and trust. I mean, unless I love and trust you, unless you love and trust me, how we can work together? It's not possible. So, I think we have spoken enough tonight. <clears throat> we've given you enough to think about until the morning class tomorrow at 6.30 a.m. These, all of you, as many possible, come tomorrow morning to the temple at 6.30 a.m. for Srimad Bhagavatam and the evening class also at 6.30 tomorrow. At great expense, I, Maharaji and I have come to Bulgaria. So please don't make our trip a waste of time by not coming to hear the classes. You all kindly come as much as possible to all of the classes.
It's easy to remember 6.30 in the morning and 6.30 in the evening. And then don't forget, Prabhupada's disappearance day is coming up on... When? What day of the week? Wednesday. Wednesday is Prabhupada's disappearance day. Big festival for Prabhupada. So, thank you very much. Raja Vidya Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.